Hey everyone, welcome to week 12 of Active Textbook Group, Cohort 1. We are in the review and synthesis weeks. It's been a great three month ish journey, and it doesn't stop here, but we'll go over that. So, two points of process for those who are here live and, of course, rewatching. And then we'll move to the more conceptual parts. So, first, in the onboarding page, you'll see these two columns. The two columns are RSVPing yes to join cohort two, part one, going through chapters one through five, if you would like to for a second time. Many people will be just doing it for fun or for learning or however they want. And also there's the opportunity to continue on with the second half of the textbook, which is going to get into a lot of the hands-on modeling and we'll be especially looking forward to developing a lot of the notebooks and interactive formats that'll help us get a lot of understanding there. Um, so please check yes for whichever row your name is in for whether you would like to continue on with part two as well as retake uh, part one as well. You'd be welcome to be just a participant and also feel free to get in touch if you are interested in taking some other role, such as like facilitating or scaffolding some aspect, but we can talk more about that for those who are interested. So point one, go to the onboarding list and continue on however you want. Second point, um, if you go to future textbook groups page, you'll see an embedded form as well as a link to the form if you want it in a new window like that. This would be exceptionally requested and helpful for you to provide some evaluations numerically and as short or as long as you want on providing feedback. Those are one way that you can provide feedback anonymously. The second way is uh, building on some of the ideas that people are already adding here. This is an editable page, so people can add thoughts as they see fit about like what would be awesome for future textbook groups or any other feedback. Or as always, they can email activeinference at gmail.com if they want like a response to any specific points. Um, and then also it's provided here the link to share for people who want to join future cohorts. So that link will be like getting people onboarded into the next cohort, which is September 2022 in this case, but this is going to be like an evergreen form that will just continue to have a list of people who expressed interest and be onboarding them into um, subsequent cohorts of which will begin several per year going forward. Any uh, And next week we'll be talking more about the feedback specifically and about projects and about carrying on. Today is like a little bit of a more conceptual synthesis and review. And again, next week will be more like logistical um, and project oriented review. So just on these points or anything else, does anyone want to just raise their hand or unmute and share anything that they like? Okay, let us conceptually review then. Um, we read the first five chapters of the Active Inference textbook. Does anyone have overall thoughts that they'd like to provide at the five chapter scale? Then we're gonna go into a chapter scale. Then we'll be continuing to dive in as um, granularly as required. But at the scale of the first five chapters, 
can see them here on this preface page, um, as well as here in the chapters list. As a unit of five chapters, what were people's sense? How did it update? Yes, please, Ben. And then Ali. Well, I was just going to say, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, as I've said to people before, I think coming from a, a non-mathematics background, I thought that these chapters were really accessible in terms of the kind of conceptual uh, things that they were putting on the table. But I, I just wondered what other people's opinions were in terms of, um, you know, understanding the conceptual toolkit of active inference before you've built up a kind of mathematical understanding um, because I'm about to start kind of um, learning some of the mathematics behind it and I wondered what people thought of um, like the the potential to fully grasp these concepts without the mathematics and what the relationship between the two might be I'm just curious what other people think about that I guess thanks great question um, Ali and then Mike and then anyone else who wants to chime in Yeah, it was a pretty exciting journey for me, uh, but um, I'll definitely need to uh, read over all those five chapters once again, at least once again, uh, in order to uh, grasp uh, more fully uh, the contents of those chapters. Uh, uh, my own personal opinion about uh, uh, the way materials uh, is organized in these uh, the first part of the textbook is uh, uh, I couldn't see a, a kind of um, hierarchical or, uh, uh, I don't know, structural uh, organization for these chapters uh, as much as I, uh, I like to see them. Because um, sometimes uh, they delve into uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical aspect of uh, all the things uh, much more deeply than the mathematical side, and sometimes uh, it's vice versa. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, if it was uh, organized in a way that, uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, we can go from uh, a, a firm, found, a firm cons conceptual foundation into uh, the granular uh, formalism and mathematics, uh, at least for me, that would be much more uh, accessible and much more, uh, I would be able to organize the materials in a, a coherent, much more coherent way in my mind. So uh, one thing uh, that uh, I really enjoyed about uh, these chapters is uh, the uh, a kind of, uh, uh, you see, uh, a kind of uh, the vision it, uh, tries to uh, put forward uh, uh, regarding the future uh, possible research uh, and also uh, things, especially in chapter five, uh, and the, the path that can be taken uh, from this point on. Thank you, Ali. Mike, and then anyone else? Yeah, I'll pick up from where Ali left off. I, I think it's... Um, somewhat remarkable that they were able to fit everything they did into those first five chapters um, and understanding they probably had some idea of how much space they wanted in that part of the book before getting into the the practical or, or applied component in part two um, you know the, the high road low road contrast and um, sort of coming at the problem from two different angles i think was useful um, like Ben, I found the math to be generally accessible, although I confess, um, I, I think I still go through this sort of pattern where, uh, I feel like I get it and I have this intuitive understanding of it, but then there are things where, uh, I sort of bog down and, uh, looking at some of the mathematical details or, um, some of the graphical representations, um, related to things like message passing, um have to slow down and, and sort of take those apart more and um I, I guess related to that i i should add i think this group has been so good at taking apart the ideas of the book this is perhaps one of the most effective settings i've seen for really 
uh, wringing concepts out of a text and, uh, you know, the work that's going on with the coda to build up the ontology and take apart the equations and things like that, I think is, is just tremendous. Awesome. Thank you. Like, yeah, it's, um, you know, the British call the maths plural instead of math as an area. And it really does engage like there's visual formalisms, which could be represented with a sparsity matrix, or it could be represented with other um, ways, but there, there are um, almost like a multi-scale diversity of formalisms ranging from more traditional equal sign in the middle mathematics to fusion schematic equation graphics um different types of notations even within the equation um and the difficulty is not signaled not that it has to be but the difficulty does provide a little whiplash sometimes because it moves variously in the main thread of the text the boxes and the appendices from like this is how linear algebra works and this is what bayes theorem is all the way to topics that are approaching physics uh, flows on partitioned states various kinds of fundamental or like in principle relationships about mathematics generally all the way to postulated architectures where message passing is implemented to achieve some computational function and or thread the needle with resembling neuro computational architectures the math is doing a lot many things are happening and and so it's um only to be expected that the perception is challenging and th there's probably a lot more to even say and um unpack there anyone else want to raise their hand and give a thought on this section one area JF and then anyone else. I have kind of a general question about um, the limits of mathematics, um, the, the notion of computational irreducibility, uh, that uh, you have to uh, go through every step of a process to get that state n plus one from state n from state n minus whatever that uh, certain problems cannot be solved um, by plugging values into a formula and generating a future state. You have to compute all the intermediate states. Um, I, I wonder where that fits in in this picture. Are, are there hard limits to the application of, of, of mathematics um, to, 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 to the problem of active inference? It's just a general question. Returning to some um, earlier comments on the firm conceptual ground. What is an area, no matter how narrow or distal from ACTINF, where people believe that there is a firm conceptual ground, they felt like that provided a foundation for them to learn further? Are we seeking an analogy to some other field of theory or practice or domain? Or are we kind of seeking for a epistemic territory that we haven't quite seen. Uh, 
I'll um, just add, I think, that what inactive inference, what you're talking about there, Jeff, is literally blankets and uncertainty. Like the corollary there of like computational irreducibility is that there's some large amount of uncertainty in hidden states in the world that you're just never going to get at. The blanket is in some sense not just how you're relating to it, but some hard limit on your, you know, your surprisal and, and things like that. So, thanks, Brock. Uh, Blue had written. Oh, yes, Mike, please. Oh, uh, so responding to the question about maybe adjacent SpaceX or spaces or topic areas. Uh, I think there's certainly overlap with concepts from system dynamics and certainly a lot of agent-based modeling has been applied uh, to model systems that have feedback loops and, and adaptation and things like that. Uh, we discussed during the, the past weeks relationships with reinforcement learning and um, I think there's a belief that active inference kind of cleans up some of the challenging or, or maybe not challenging, but uh, less formalized or less defined aspects related to reinforcement learning, such as uh, how do you engineer a utility function that makes sense in the context of what you're trying to model. Thanks. Agreed about creating a uh, integrated utility function. There's so many unprincipled, not to say ineffective, or not even to say not elegant, but unprincipled methods of creating a uh, Chimera utility model, like delay discounting, novelty bonus, curiosity bonuses, um, alternating phases or hyperparameters that, um, as well as purely implementational strategies like um, discarding burn in parallel chains, there's like a whole toolkit and indeed fields on creating effectively integrated utility models. And putting that work into the construction of the generative model and how the generative model is partitioned from the generative process allows a generic free energy functional or set of related free energy formulations to play that role. So that's one very interesting angle as well as the way that that process of specifying the generative model and generative processes and so on are world models, whether in the Jan LeCun sense or in the Adam Saffron sense. These generative models encompass world models and deep learning approaches and various um, topics like that. Um, so let's see, Blue wrote, I wish there was practice problems in the book to develop our understanding. Yes. Um, to a large extent, and also it's whether people want to reflect on any specific questions or even just on this, um, scheme. These are many of these questions. These questions can be um, open, infinite game type questions about the material. They can be clearly addressable questions about the material. They can be um, checks for understanding, but we'll be continuing to develop and improve and curate questions around the material. So I, I um, I think it's a great comment, and this is why we have this future textbook groups and all of these affordances for people to stay involved and, and be improving 
this as well as experimenting in their own spaces and ways to, to develop the kinds of material that are helping them learn and understand. Any more section one overview thoughts? Chapters one through five and the framing of the book being that the first five chapters are more focused on the conceptual background and the second five chapters are going to be starting with a recipe for designing the active models and, and getting more into the modeling itself. So any section one through five commentary. The book comprises two parts, page three. These are aimed at readers who want to understand active inference, first part, and those who seek to use it for their own research, second part. The first part of the book introduces active inference, both conceptually and formally, contextualizing it within current theories of cognition. How did they succeed? And where was there a divergence between what you preferred a priori or now? Comprehensive, formal, and self-contained introduction to active inference. Its main constructs and implications for the study of brain and cognition. I'm uh, I'm interested in the distinction between uh, understanding active inference and using it for our own research, and the way that that's set up as those being two completely separate things. Um, it seems to, to suggest that one could fully understand active inference and yet not be in a position to use it in their own research, not having worked through the second half of the book, and I think that's quite interesting. It is good comment. Thank you. Um, not to uh, spoil the ending, but the last sentence is, ultimately, we are confident that you will continue to pursue active inference in some form. There may be a multi-year incubation for different people and contexts. Many people now or even in some amazing decentralized science future, they may not think of themselves as researchers or of doing research. Though they may be even included on research projects. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting uh, comments about how they distinguish like theory and learning from part two research and practice however um they discuss applications but this isn't the playbook it's not the toolkit it's not the modeling tool ecosystem mike yeah that's an interesting comment at the end uh, and I don't know if this is my perceptual bias, but there seems to be this implicit assumption that active inference is the way to go. Basically, this is the tool to use uh, <laughs> within the text. And so as a result, what's not there is a discussion of uh, maybe these are cases where you might not want to use active inference, or these are cases where applying active inference could create challenges in what you're solving for.
Ali and anyone else. Yeah, and in fact, one of the uh, mo most popular criticisms put toward uh, the active inference uh, or FEP in general is that uh, it tries to explain everything. Uh, it ends up explaining nothing. So, <laughs> yeah, that might be. Yeah, I think there's a risk of maybe not sufficiently constraining the problem space or, or you know, leaving things undefined in a way that uh, allow for active interest to be the solution without a critical point of view. They highlight behavior and cognition. I mean, one could almost see even the name active inference as being a synthesis of action, behavior, and cognition inference in ways that as we're discovering and, and unpacking, they're integrated in ways that other formalisms of perception as a type of cognition, so we can just lump it there. Other frameworks of behavior and cognition have not integrated or have approached from a uh, non-first principles. Or maybe they do follow first principles, like the higher the impact factor, the better the paper, something like that. That's a first principle. Um, no, just kidding. Um, but placing it within the framework of cognition while also surfing on a wave of something like pan-cognitivism or like pan-computationalism does expand the scope. And that's even before one starts to enter into the more recent research especially where there is a highlight on system persistence, not simply in terms of the resistance to dissipation and tropically, but in a relational context as repeated measurements, like in the quantum work. So it's like cognition. Oh, like brains, like that schema with the brain or with like a person. Well, oh, by cognition, it's any system with a blanket that we're interacting with through repeated measurement. Is that cognition? Where did cognition go? Brock? I, um, I kind of want to, I guess, echo all those things that were just said about the common criticism and this, where does it apply, where does it not apply, but also, I guess, um, all those things that you were just listing, like, I, I wonder, <clears throat> I always hear that from people that have not um, engaged with the material. Um, and from my engagement with it, it seems like all of the examples in which it is used, it are... Um, complex dynamical systems that don't have great, that have at best mathematical approximations and have almost no or literally no kind of analytical um, approaches. It just seems like a good way to model a system of things, of entities that are interacting. Um, and I don't, I, I guess what I'm, to, to put it into like one question is like what is uh is that kind of some anthropomorphizing or whatever projecting of like well it's applied to this it's applied to that it must apply to everything and um you know how can it apply to all those things how can it apply everywhere it's like we're, it's not applying to everywhere it's just applying to these complex systems which are everywhere but also don't have and you know we're not trying to model the apple falling from the tree or the hyper you know the 
in these sorts of simple cases or something is not being applied there. It, I mean, is it? I don't. I haven't seen actually. You know, now that I think about it, any of those sorts of situations where it's applied to things that we already understand in this, like maybe in some back checking way, but not in a like way that's suggested that we should use this much more complex, you know, approach to something that's kind of check already got that, you know, um, thanks Brock. Um, Ali. Yeah, I kind of feel that, uh, some of these criticisms, uh, stems from stem from the fact uh, from a serious a lack of deep understanding of uh, uh, concepts related to uh, FAP and active inference. Uh, for example, uh, I came across a PhD thesis just today uh, in which uh, it, it, it tries to uh, critique everything related to Markov blanket, but as I was glancing over it, uh, I, uh, I observed uh, some serious uh, gaps uh, in her argument uh, throughout all, in all the uh, all the thesis, and uh, I think uh, materials such as this book uh, can definitely help in filling up uh, these gaps of understanding, uh, which even uh, the uh, the serious researchers uh, are suffering from. Yes, thanks. So to um, this thread, I've never heard it about the linear model. How could the linear model be used in so many settings? It explains nothing. Well, is the linear model an explanation? Or is it an investigative tool in the investigator's toolbox? So at least for me personally, it doesn't need to have um, broader reach than those who resonate with it. But again, I always try to ask, would somebody say this or could they say that about a linear model? And then if the act in formalism with F equals dot, 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 or G equals dot, 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 and all of the predicates that it's associated with and the partition and all of that, could someone say that about y equals mx plus b? And then if not, and there may be cases where it is not the same, what is it that's different about active inference? Or is it a, a valid and important and even reasonable question, but one that might be bumping up like what JF raised about computational irreducibility or about map territory, even disguised or camouflaged questions about relationality. Well, how can complexity science apply to so many topics? We're applying complexity science to whatever topic we want to. Where's the issue? Mike and then Ron. Yeah, a lot of it hinges on um, how the model is to be applied and, and what the intent of model application is. So taking the linear model as an example, we might use something like that uh, to be predictive about a linear system. And so there's potential value there. Uh, when we do system dynamics models, a lot of times the value in doing a system dynamics model is aligning the stakeholders around what are the model components and how do we think about those model components? So working through a process similar to like what we've done in this textbook group, although few do it as rigorously, um, to identify the system elements and how they interact and interrelate and so forth. And, and that can lead to um, more advanced implementation like agent-based models. Um, but a lot of times, at least in my experience, those agent-based models are used for deeper systems understanding more than say predictive power for what the system is going to do at some point in the future. So uh, again, it comes back to the, the reason for applying the models and thinking about how the model fits with that reason and, and what sort of results you would expect from that. Thank you, Mike. Ron? Uh, yeah, I, I generally agree with what both you and Mike said. So from a practitioner's perspective, uh, I mean, we do hear criticisms of 
linear models where it's not that they don't, uh, but it's usually about which domain it's applied in. Uh, yeah, uh, but generally speaking, well, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, if, because active inference is probably more complex and it takes a lot more time to crop than y equals mx plus b, which could be one reason for these kind of criticisms. And it's probably like that they're falling back into old habits. Okay, why should I jump my old model? As opposed to adopting this newer, more, uh, well, how much more does it explain than what I already know? I think that probably is driving a lot of the criticism of these things. Thank you. I can't help but add a domain specific example. Um, this is a 2016 paper that is speaking to like a multi decade, multi career brouhaha about different approaches to modeling evolution and selection, for example, in the eusocial insects and in social animals as well. And this article is very fascinating because they use a, a Bayesian causal graph to identify situations where two different formulations, the kin and the multi-level selection models, have identical predictions. Where the causal graphs have identical predictions, any measurement you can think of as being like on a y equals x manifold where it doesn't resolve your uncertainty about which framework is correct or not. Yet the literature is littered with, we, we measured these ovaries, so kin selection is or isn't happening. However, a vast set of those empirical cases might be essentially falling on this manifold where those two models are not distinguishable. And so this is a theory driven approach, like a first principles approach to identify situations that are providing unique informative value in this case about kin and multi-level selection and knowing what territories measurements will not have explanatory value, which relates to active inference. Um, just like uh, Rohan and, and like many people have brought up, especially when we kind of take like a meta science or like a communicating science or onboarding people into active concern, like people are asking explicitly or implicitly, why should I update my cognitive model? What is the value of active inference? Can you appetize me with a two minute video so I can understand it or with a two minute video so it's enough to want to continue going down that path? There's a lot to say and there's um, a lot of work to identify the situations and the ways of truly addressing and perhaps even resolving long-standing scientific divergences. Like, if it is the case that the explore-exploit dialectic is addressed in a novel way through the free energy functional balancing pragmatic and epistemic reward, that is quite a vast scope. people continue to use explore and exploit today. And it isn't even that, that those ontology terms wouldn't be useful in the future. In fact, some of the um, discussions on like folk psychology with the belief, desires, intentions, can we say what an active inference entity wants or intends based upon its beliefs and its desires, for example? Can we still talk about exploratory and exploitative behavior as a phenomena, but have a different way of modeling how that behavior arises or, or is um, regulated? What are the settings in 
behavioral cognitive science, what are the settings in uh, where systems dynamics has been applied, where we can now use active inference to identify where have we been just throwing a thousand darts at the same grain of sand? Where are the vast fields where we don't even know? And as people have highlighted, the book is written with a specific rhetorical bent, both explicitly and implicitly, um, for the regime of attention of the book to be about active inference, one can read as an implicit endorsement that this is something that is valid or valuable to pursue. And especially at this stage in the field, it is almost like an exhortation to persist amidst uncertainty to learn and apply a few disjointed thoughts there but hope it makes sense let's look back to the sections of the book anyone can raise their hand or give a thought like how could the book you write begin What reviewer comments, whether you're reviewer one, reviewer two, reviewer three, what comments would you have provided if this were like a draft? And you could even make structural suggestions. So I have a lot of comments there. <laughs> yes, blue and then Ron. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I uh, so like having taught lots of classes before. Like I think um, a list of like key terms and definitions would be like critical. I mean, I mean, and like learning objectives for each chapter. Um, like I said, uh, like a practice quiz. Like test your knowledge of this. Like like. What is surprise? Like how many different forms of surprise are there? You know, I mean, like like just some pr practice questions to see if you grasped the concepts prevented in each chapter. Um, and especially like uh, what I was mentioning in the chat, like math problems, like practice, like can you set up your own generative model? Um, like, like what would the, like, or even just the Bayesian graph, like, can you make a Bayesian graph? Like, what would that look like for, you know, give a, give a question, like a verbal description and then give, give the Bayesian graph like answer or like make the answers available online. So you could test your own knowledge of the subject first. Um, I, I think that that would be like totally instrumental in, in using this functionally like a textbook anyway. So sorry. Thanks blue. Nice uh, predictive programming. Rohan, and then Brock. Uh, yeah, uh, so my, uh, as a practitioner, right, I, I work in the engineering field. I'm a control systems engineer. My preference would be to immediately see some application, not necessarily to control systems, but something that it begins with like a project and explains how active inference is better than its own baseline. That would be interesting to see. Uh, like a perfect example of this would be, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Fast AI uh, by Rachel Thomas and Jeremy Howard. They have uh, a very unique way of teaching. Uh, uh, so they have a computational linear algebra course. So the way they teach the linear algebra part is by basically implementing Gaussian blur, for example, and then connecting it to so you start with the code and then you do the math, then you connect it to the math. So something like that might be far more useful, uh, maybe not from an point, but it would definitely be useful for practitioners around the world. Okay, so this, so if, you know, controls engineer gets this, okay, this looks like a better form of model predictive 
control I can replace my model predictive controller with something that resembles actual inference. It might actually make uh, it might we might actually make more progress that way that it actually gets out of the world. Thank you, Rowan. Brock? Um, yeah, I I think I mean I've had similar comments to that of um, you know fast AI and benchmarks that that's kind of the ultimate way that's just the way that um, practitioners change their um, attention now um, and that would be really useful but in in the context of the book um, I think I agree with every, everything else that was said too uh, I'm not sure how realistic it is to do that from the point, that, you know, where the whole uh, field is at right now. Sorry about that. Um, but, you know, I think just having some, some things in context, like there's always this comment about like, you know, it's a nonlinear thing. A text is linear. So of course it will be out of, out of order, but like, um, often the definitions of things are kind of scattered throughout the explanation of them and um, kind of um, italicized instead of kind of brought up to the top, you know, in some um, way you might expect that I, at least from my, my pedagogical experience, everything, like all math is taught to, you know, like to define your knowns and unknowns and variables at the top and this sort of thing, right? Um, the in the context of like the appendices, um, again, there's like I understand that it's a lot. You can't you know do you can't add that all in or whatever. But just if there was like um, either every whenever uh, the the next part of the appendice became relevant. You know, um, again, just like having it at the top, like at each section, you're like, okay, so we're going to use part, you know, now building on, you know, what we've done already, like now we're going to use this part of the, this section in the appendices in this section, our equation, one, two, three, whatever in, in, in this next section, like just stating it up front again, just like a, like a, you know, big box at the top or whatever. Um, it just would help like in wayfinding and disentangling the unfortunate linear um, format of books that is mapped to this complex thing. Um, and so, yeah, the, I don't know, those, those general things would be helpful. One other thing that is maybe beyond the scope of this book, but I um, spoke to Ali about very briefly at one point about the notation like even in the basic example of the frog here, um, like Bayesian notation, it's um, it's incredibly easy to manipulate variables when they're one letter and subscripts, but when the whole variable is like ten or twenty letters, like you know, frog p, p of x equals frog jump, you know, condition on y, it's like it becomes a, a larger I don't, I don't know if this is just me and dyslexic, you know, like, I don't know, but um, it just seems harder to cognitively kind of um, work with that. Um, I don't know. Thank you, That's... Brock. Yes, the, the chunking is multi-level and there, there, it will be great to explore ways to um, learn around that. Here are a few forays where we can copy quotes and have inline definitions. So for those who are interested in this kind of work with an open source textbook, it is not an infinite task or even a non-automatable task to copy out the plain text and integrate it with a versioning ontology so that the definition can be like even rendered differently. It could be in a different language. It could be every single time that a term comes up. There's like so much enrichment that this seed can lead to 
of the textbook. And a lot of it is for us to pick up, honestly. Rohan, and then anyone else. Oh, I forgot to put down. Oh, oh, no worries. Thank you. Hmm. So in our um, last seven or so minutes for this session. Next week, we will continue with any conceptual points and questions that people want to raise. We'll also be turning our attention a bit more to uh, making sure, first off, that please, please, everyone complete the feedback form in the future textbook groups and or add information here or um, contact us because it's just one of the most important feedback mechanisms we have. We'll also be exploring a little bit different project ideas. Um, several of these threads involving different system models we've already found a home for in the active block fronts project where we're meeting uh twice on wednesdays weekly other projects we're going to have new vistas on during and after going through the second half of the textbook, which is uh, still black and white static PDFs, but we'll be able to augment this heavily with some simulation tools, um, as well as other work like the plain text enrichment or even anyone who wants to collaborate on an audiobook version there's um, no lack of act inf tasks today. And these are like high leverage point moments where staying in the game and improving the game will do tremendous service towards reducing research debt and improving the rigor in the applications that we see. Rohan? Yeah, uh, can I make a project suggestion? That's fine. Yes, please. Or, Everyone can. Yeah, so the, yeah, okay. So there is, uh, I'm going to put this in the chat. There's this online lab by Georgia Tech's Intelligence Systems <laughs> Unit uh, called Robotaria. Uh, that's basically a bunch of swarm, it's to test swarm controllers. So uh, there's a good baseline over here it would be a good idea to try like an uh, active inference version, uh, like an active inference inspired swarm controller to finish the tasks over here. So this runs on actual robots in that lab and you can see the results. This is awesome. Um, I had some colleagues who worked with um, some of the ant groups here it's right at the intersection of like JF's work and many's interest in the embodied and robotic angle. And we have somewhat extensive um, multi-scale generative models of ants, which would apply to oh. other swarm settings as well. So absolutely. Um, we are, want to scaffold those projects and one way to start but not the only way to start is to copy a version of this these fields and add and remove as relevant for you and give some okay. um handle for others to be involved or just stay in the game so that um more people can join there will be a flow of people entering active inference forever how will we yeah. greet them so and, uh what, yes. what would i need to put in over there? um 
like it, it depends on how you want to carry forward the project but you can feel in this row add any notes you'd like and um more details on what you're thinking of doing and then however you want to be more specific about like directions and and just signal it in the idea or you can in the um notes or, or draft catechism which is what these templates are um, based on and if there is ever something you're not sure about then ask around and um different projects are going to proceed differently okay yeah uh so i'll fill that out with my talks and awesome well interesting meeting it's our penultimate discussion in this section then we hope that everybody who is motivated and ready to do so continues for part two and or rejoins for part one cohort two both of these will be starting in september so we'll take August um, off of the textbook. And uh, at this point, the tentative plan is that we'll have two sequential hours, like section one and then followed by section two, so that those who are on section one can um, see how section two is we can explore different architectures and stuff. And again, this is like why people's active participation and their feedback and the oversharing on topic and just writing all the questions that came in their mind and all the things that they would want to ask somebody to check. Like every contribution is important. Does anyone else have any thing they'd like to add before we stop the recording? Okay. Stopping the recording. Oh yeah, someone go for it. All right, stopping the recording.